So continuing to talk about the facet joint or the Z joints, there is definitely a relationship between the shape of these joints and the motion involved. Uh, so if you look at the lumbar spine right here, you can see because these joints are aligned this way, it allows for flexion and extension to occur. But because of their orientation, which is relatively vertical, very close to vertical in nature, if this joint tries to rotate to the right or to the left, it is essentially blocked from that rotation. And that'll be something to help you look at a skeleton or physically look at this to see if you can imagine, even if you could take the spine uh, and just kind of twist it. You'll notice it doesn't twist very well, but it bends forward uh, and backwards relatively easily. But at the same point, it's going to extend much less than it is going to flex. At some point with extension, you're going to run both intervertebral um, facet joints into each other, and that's going to block or limit that motion. Here's a great representation of this. This is a really good chart to, to know and to look at this. Uh, it's not something I think you have to memorize. You certainly can, but it's better to think about the anatomy and think about how the anatomy and the shape of the bones drive the motion that's available. So we just talked about the lumbar spine, uh, for example, and you can see within the sagittal plane, the most amount of movement is occurring as opposed to the other plane. So if you look at rotation, because of the orientation of the facet joints, there really does not allow much rotation at all. Lateral flexion is a little bit more, but you can see in each segment, less than five degrees. Now, you combine all these segments and you can get 20, 30 degrees, uh, but individually it's not in rotation. Even if you combine all these, the lumbar spine, we're still dealing with really minimal rotation, whereas L5S1 can get us more flexion uh, and extension than total rotation of the entire lumbar spine. So the lumbar spine is definitely made for more flexion and extension. We think about rotation and twisting, but where does that come from? It, it comes from other places. It comes if you look at all these segments. Granted, the thoracic spine doesn't have a rotation a lot of rotation, but when you add up all these segments and each one contributes a little bit, there's a fair amount of rotation that we can perform at the trunk and it comes from the thoracic spine. But where do we get the most rotation? Without a doubt, C1, C2 turning our head gives us so much rotation. They even put this little symbol there because they can't show you how much rotation. It just blows the others out of the water, which is why we're looking at closer to 40 degrees. So that's this chart isn't to scale for that reason. So that's that's an important thing to know. So look through that and see if you have any questions about that. Next topic we're getting into is called spinal coupling, which is something important to consider. So spinal coupling is looking at not motions that are performed together um, only, uh, but looking at how those synergistically perform. For example, we know that with raising your arm, if I asked you to raise your head or arm over your head, those would typically be coupled in multiple planes. So you would often raise your head in the scapular plane, but that's a coupling at the shoulder. It's a force couple uh, created in multiple planes, typically in the sagittal and frontal plane, and that's combined. At the spine, we also have these coupled patterns. So it's not just um, a combination of multiple patterns of, of only one motion, um, but it's looking at one motion about an axis with another motion around a different axis point. The example of that would be at the cervical spine looking at side bending and rotation. So if I ask you to turn your head to the right, you notice that you're probably not going to do that purely in a transverse plane. You are likely going to do some frontal plane movement with that. When you turn your head to the right, you're probably going to bring your nose towards your right shoulder, not necessarily towards your right ear. If you brought it towards your right ear, that would be more pure rotation, which you can do, but it's not as natural of a movement, which is why we, we couple it together. Then it's important to note that there is some debate 
about how these coupled motions perform. So we're going to talk about that uh, further and in your PowerPoint you could look ahead to this. Uh, but there is some controversy about how these motions occur and I think that's because in different individuals and in different studies there are unique coupling patterns that are found and when people have some type of pathology whether that's a disc herniation or an abnormal motion or movement control pattern they tend to couple these motions differently so there are unique things with this uh, but there are ways to test that and to to understand that um, so we're gonna leave this as a question mark for right now because I want to save to discuss this more in class later one of the things that uh, we talk about at the spine is this torsion this rotary effect uh, and with this that we're talking about axial rotation and with that it's not just pure rotation in the transverse plane but it's often a coupled movement uh, that occurs in multiple planes at once so if you think about how we can generate a lot of torque usually it's some type of torsion in a coupled motion if I want to hit a golf bar golf ball far distance if I want to hit a baseball a far distance if I want to hit a tennis ball a far distance I'm not going to perform pure trunk rotation I'm likely going to combine that with some type of rotation flexion extension uh, side bending I'm gonna take those movements together and all the muscles involved with that to generate the most amount of torque possible so often there's some bending with that um, there's compression, so there's lifting with that, and there's torsion with that. Um, <clears throat> with patients, sometimes we describe this as the BLT. So there's the bending, the lifting, and the twisting, and that makes a lot of sense to patients. This is when we are able to generate the most amount of force. It's also the time in which our spine is susceptible to injury because when we ever create a lot of force, whether it's at our shoulder or spine, it can be problematic uh, and it can be more aggressive going along with forces one of the forces that's a little more unique to the spine and we discuss more is this shear force so with shear force uh, you can see there's different components to this and um, this is going back to chapter one uh, when you have um, body weight gravity taking the trunk down but you have um, some different forces here so let me get a different color here for this so you have compression that's going to occur in this um, direction um, and then you have this shear force that wants to occur in this direction the, the composite force is going to be summarized um, here and so so with that with gravity taking you this way compression this way you're getting this component of shear related to that and if this vertebrae goes in this direction we're going to refer to that as an anterior shear of the vertebrae or an anterior translation uh, so this is what's known as shear and in particular uh, if you look at the spine you can see that up here there's a lot less anterior shear because there's some curvature here but it's for the most part relatively vertical whereas here there's a greater angle this is known as the lumbo sacral angle so obviously the sacrum lumbar lumbo sacral angle the greater the lumbo sacral ang angle the greater the shear force and then the greater the potential complications that may occur with this now let's talk a little bit more at the uh, cervical spine cervical spines move a lot although we may be sitting and our lumbar spines are relatively stationary we're constantly looking up looking down turning our head doing a lot of movement at the cervical spine uh, and let's say um, you're, you're doing that you're sitting you're watching a sport you're watching TV you can keep your ankle relatively relaxed you can put your foot on on the couch or an ottoman or something like that and you cannot move your ankle at all it's easy to immobilize the ankle joint 
But imagine the challenge in mobilizing the cervical spine. Uh, it's constantly moving. So for that reason, we're doing a lot of these movements. Do you think it would be more tonic in nature or more phasic in nature with the sustained movements that we have? Uh, generally speaking, we're going to deal with more tonic uh, muscles, uh, more slow twitch type uh, muscles at the cervical spine. Just a, a more of an anatomy review. This gets back to the segments as well. So if I have C6 and C7 intervertebral uh, segment represented here, between C6 and C7, we're going to have that C7 nerve root. So uh, in here, if I have this C7, C8, what nerve root is exiting there? Well, it can't be C7 because that's exiting up here, so this must be C8. Here's another visualization of this, so you can see the nerve roots uh, exiting out here. We are going to distinguish between the upper cervical spine and, and then the lower cervical spine, and we'll talk about the movements that occur with each of those during retraction and protraction of the cervical spine. But you can see the ligaments are represented really nicely here, so you can see how much space these supraspinous and interspinous ligaments take. Um, ligamentum nuque as well is, is pictured there. So if you have a motion such as a whiplash type injury, you can see how much forceful extension and flexion are occurring. Uh, <clears throat> the phrase you may hear with this is the coup, counter coup, because there's the initial coup, uh, the force going in, but then the recoil back in the opposite direction can also be problematic, and you can think about the typical motions uh, there. But if you look at this motion, you can see the chin is going to often hit the sternum uh, there, and there may be some soft tissue approximation in some individuals as well. Uh, but ultimately, we look at all that cervical extension that occurs. Um, so in whiplash, well, sometimes referred to as acceleration injuries, uh, the extension component here is often more troublesome than the flexion component, which is why in our cars and our vehicles um, now, as opposed to the 1950s uh, or 60s, vehicle, they have that headrest to stop the extension. But if you have a force coming in and extension is limited, that means you're going to occur flexion quicker. So sometimes now, uh, depending on how the headrest is set up, we might have more of a flexion injury, but in most vehicles now, there's an airbag so it can stop or limit how much flexion. And that's really the, the key with preventing significant cervical injuries is preventing the overall motion that occurs. Consequently, while we prevent injuries here, if you have this sudden shift the, in the brain between flexion and extension or anterior and posterior forces, uh, the brain can be injured. So you may minimize injury with a headrest and an airbag, uh, but you may also result in more injury to the cerebrum as, as well. So clinically, um, this is a patient that I was seeing um, in the clinic, and, and if you look at her sitting up here, you could see a slight resting curvature. We know at the cervical spine there is that lordosis, but sometimes the upper thoracic spine starts to change in nature where there's kyphosis, but that can merge into the lower cervical spine, especially if you were to slouch or to move um, in different directions. It's going to change this natural lower doses. Uh, but if I were to ask her to bend forwards or bring her chin to her chest, performing cervical flexion, we would take this cervical lower doses and we would do what's known as a curve reversal. So with cervical flexion, with proper alignment, it actually should perform a cervical kyphosis or flexion of the cervical spine, even though the resting state of the cervical spine is in extension. 
So you can see some clinical ways or real life ways. If I'm sitting on a bench, I may actually perform more extension to look down or I'm laying down, I might get the chin on the chest that way. So we're performing a lot of cervical flexion technique as we've nicknamed it. One thing to know, I like to draw attention to this uh, again, Yonda's upper and lower cross syndrome. Um, this will, will definitely be some test material and I know it carries over into clinical assessment. It's good to know these patterns uh, because we often see a lot of patients that sit like this or going back to the last slide with the tech neck. They're very common scenarios that we're encountering. So with this forward head position, rounded shoulder position, we can sometimes develop this, not the tattoo, but this hump. Sometimes patients will say, oh yeah, I have this hump. This is known as a dowager's hump, and it's something we may note in the clinical documentation. But you can see, if I ask this patient to bring their head back, and remember we're trying to align the external auditory meatus with their chromium, which is close in that case, it does decrease that hump. And if, if you look at posture and aging, you'll notice how this hump typically becomes more prominent with poor posture and with aging. Certainly, there is a muscular component to that. And if we're in this more forward head position, this, this posture, uh, there is some tightness. Uh, you take the upper trapezius, for example, upper trapezius, and there's going to be a shortening of those muscles, and that's when they could develop trigger points and other issues. Um, so the, the cervical flexors are often shortened in this forward head position, and they're more lengthened in this neutral position, which is what we're, we're going after. Uh, and if you look at the suboccipital extensor muscles, so going back to this as well, you could see uh, semispinalis capitis, and you could see the change um, with that as well. And the injury that can occur, the trigger points, the tenderness to those areas as, as well. So it's important to look at these suboccipital uh, musculature. Uh, here's another visualization of that and with the axis of rotation and how that's going to be forced uh, down. Uh, uh, longus capitis um, and longus coli are going to work synergistically with the trapezius to stabilize the head to produce that, uh, that force couple at the cervical spine. So that's it for this one. We're going to continue looking at these postural mechanics uh, in chapter 13. Uh, so that'll be where we transition to from here. Thanks.